rodent SCPs. The term rodent, often used pejoratively, refers to animals belonging to the order Rodentia, which includes mice, rats, squirrels, beavers, guinea pigs, and hamsters. Rodents at their worst are harmful pests, damaging food stores and spreading disease, while rodents at their best are lovable household pets. Of course, rodents are present in the SCP universe as anomalies, much like every other type of animal. We're going to take a look at several anomalous rodents, some dangerous, some far from it, but all of them pretty weird. First up is SCP-6369, which is not a rodent itself, but rather a Nokia mobile phone, with a single number saved in its contacts list. The number is listed as RAT LOST AND FOUND, and calling the number connects the caller to an automated selection system, which will ask a series of questions inquiring about a lost personal possession. These questions include what item the caller needs found, where they believe they may have lost it, and what form of payment will be given for its recovery. This service requires a number of conditions to be met, otherwise the system will instead play a pre-recorded message apologizing for the inconvenience before ending the call. First, the item has to be actually lost to the owner, instead of intentionally hidden or having a second person purposefully hide an object for them. Second, the item has to have been lost within the last two years, and can't weigh more than five kilograms. Third, the area that the lost item is located in can't have any rodent traps or predator animals, such as snakes, cats, or birds of prey. Fourth, the caller has to have payment ready before placing the call. The call must be placed on a weekday, and the service's employees must not be currently active elsewhere. If all of these conditions are met, one or more employees will manifest outside of the building the call was placed from, within 30 minutes. These employees will appear as a variety of fancy rat, all directing or driving an autonomous robotic vacuum cleaner. As far as the foundation can figure, all of these vacuum cleaners were legitimately purchased at one point, and in some cases they had malfunctioned and the prior owner had intended to trash them. The rats will use these vacuum cleaners to knock on the door of the building by bumping into it. The number of rats present depends on the size of the building the call is placed from, with items lost in small apartments typically resulting in a single rat appearing. The largest noted response involved 60 rats, accompanied by 10 vacuums, in order to search a school. Upon arriving, they will proceed to dismount their vacuums and search for the lost item. Once found, they will place a call to the Nokia phone, and carry the item to its owner, either holding it in their mouths or using their front paws. After it's returned, the phone will ring again, and an automated message will request a service payment ranging from 2 to 30 US dollars. Should a caller not provide payment, the rats will leave without issue, but the phone will no longer function for that caller in the future. The payment doesn't have to be in US currency, however, as the rats will accept a wide range of items. They'll accept carrots, lettuce, tomatoes, blueberries, and Yogi's brand rodent treats, just as freely as US currency. They'll accept chicken eggs if boiled, chicken and fish meat if it's cooked and unseasoned, walnuts if they've been cracked, beef if it's boiled and unseasoned, and melons if they've been cut into parts. Cheese is especially valuable to them if of high quality but if there are multiple rats present on the call, they'll only accept food if it can be shared among them equally. They'll also accept high quality rodent dry food, ham, salami, and turkey. They won't accept citrus fruits, office supplies, caffeinated beverages, 
high value items such as gold watches or cell phones, and products associated with animal testing. A short log shows some of the lost items the Foundation tested the rats with. One rat found a doctor's keys in her office after 15 minutes, and was given one strawberry as payment. Twenty rats searched an entire site for a doctor's notebook for an hour and 38 minutes, and were given $30 as payment. Seventeen rats found a doctor's eyeglasses in the same site after 38 minutes, and were given 34 blueberries, two for each rat. It took 30 rats an hour and 40 minutes to find a doctor's coffee cup, which ended up being broken into four pieces and crudely glued back together, suggesting that someone broke it and tried to hide it. The rats were given a whole watermelon divided into equal parts for each of them. Ten rats took five minutes to track down a senior researcher's lunch, finding it in another doctor's personal fridge. The rats were given the apple and pear from the lunch as payment. A maintenance technician lost his wrench, and a single rat appeared, climbed up his leg, and pulled the wrench out of one of his pockets. The rat was given five peas as payment. After using the phone 20 times, a notable rat appeared in front of the phone's containment locker, wearing a miniature headset. The rat was contained and assigned to junior researcher Perry due to her familiarity with the care of its species. This rat will disappear from its cage whenever the rat service is active in a nearby location, appearing at the active search site and seemingly directing the other rats, using squeaking and limb gesturing. It will also handle distribution of food rewards among the rats. It will then reappear in the holding cage after the task is complete. Using a computer with a keyboard, an interview was able to be held with the rat, who stated that its name is Iro. Iro says that they perform this service so that people will know that rats are clean, and good animals. Iro had a human companion before, but he doesn't know where they are now. This human taught them to find lost items, along with some other tricks. He doesn't mind staying here, as long as they can help keep finding lost stuff. Iro was placed in a large cage in Perry's office, along with a non-anomalous fancy rat to keep him company. Neither Iro nor the accompanying rat seem to be aging, despite the common short lifespan of rats. The Foundation determined that the phone originally belonged to a Mr. Adrian Silverton, an elderly retiree who passed away in 2019. Silverton ran a secondhand electronics shop, and his family described him as an advocate against the negative stigma associated with pet rats as well as an amateur software app developer. The Foundation found a side room filled with empty small mammal cages, which the family explained as Silverton's animal sanctuary for surrendered pet rats. The family claims that all of the rats disappeared when Grandpa Silverton passed away. That was definitely more on the lovable side of rats. So let's try something a bit more on the pest side. SCP-027 isn't exclusively about rodents, but rather it's a phenomenon that affects a single human at a time, causing them to be constantly surrounded by swarming vermin that are drawn to their location. The subject does not appear able to assert any sort of control over these vermin, and is in fact prone to occasional attacks from the creatures, as well as those that come too close to the subject. The creatures will mostly disperse whenever the subject leaves a location, but once arriving somewhere else, an initial swarm of flying insects such as gnats and flies will begin to form a cloud around them within a few minutes. Shortly thereafter, other creatures such as lice, Cockroaches, worms, spiders, mice, and rats will begin to appear. More and more of them will appear the longer the subject stays in one location. 
If the host of this phenomenon should die, it will then transfer to another individual. How the phenomenon transfers and how it decides whom to transfer to is unknown, and so far only two individuals have been host to it while in Foundation custody. It's likely that this phenomenon has transferred a large number of times in the past, with research indicating that it's been around for a century at the very least. The Foundation first discovered it in the 90s, finding a subject living in an abandoned warehouse that had been completely overrun by rats, cockroaches, and other vermin. The subject is a Caucasian male in his late 30s, gaunt, filthy, and covered in bites and scratches. He shows symptoms of degraded mental health, which isn't too surprising given the situation, evidence of heavy use of alcohol and illicit drugs, and signs of prolonged sleep deprivation. He's taken into containment, but doesn't live much longer. After his death, an autopsy revealed that there were a number of creatures inside of his body, including a colony of rats nesting in his abdomen for a number of generations. A few days later, a security officer with the Foundation reported being awoken by breathing problems due to a large housefly having crawled up his nose, which was later shown to have lain eggs. The officer was designated as the new host of SCP-027, kept alive to ensure that the phenomenon didn't transfer to any high-value personnel. Simple but horrible. Continuing on, SCP-1318 is a phenomenon that affects an estimated 0.0001% of a specific strain of Norwegian brown rats. These anomalous rats are normal in every way except for one. Humans that spend 20 to 80 cumulative hours in close proximity to one will develop a delusional complex. This complex includes the delusion that the rat is sapient and capable of speech, and that the rat is an expert in the person's field of employment. They'll believe that their best ideas come from conversations with the rat, and that possession of the rat provides a significant competitive advantage, so that they won't want to share data about the rat with outside organizations. They'll also believe that the rat's unique properties are possibly hereditary, and that any offspring should be exempt from experimentation pending unspecified analysis. In addition to the cumulative exposure, anyone that is introduced to the rat by an affected individual will immediately be affected by the same delusions. Recordings of the apparent conversations between an affected individual and the rat reveal that the individual is in fact simply sub-vocalizing the rat's responses to their own questions. None of the responses were found to lie outside of the knowledge of the affected individual. This phenomenon was first discovered when a routine performance review in 1993 found that productivity at the Biosciences Laboratory at Site-27 had declined by 75% in a six-month period, without a corresponding decline in research quality. Investigations revealed that the entire staff of the lab were affected by delusions pertaining to a male rat whom they had dubbed Frankie. Two members of the investigating team were likewise affected before the nature of the anomaly could be determined. All of the affected personnel were interviewed and treated with amnestics, although 15% of the staff suffered from persistent delusional states and were subsequently relieved of duty. During an interview with one of the affected researchers, he states that Frankie is real easy to talk to and has a great head for organic chemistry, like nobody he's ever seen. He had been getting really stuck trying to synthesize a component from an SCP, and while complaining about it to a fellow researcher, they suggested that he run it by Frankie. The other researcher led him into a mostly empty storeroom, where a rat sat inside of a large cage. The researcher began to speak to Frankie, and Frankie apparently began to speak back. 
He says that you'd expect a rat like that to have a squeaky voice, but Frankie just sounded like a regular guy. After explaining to Frankie what he was trying to accomplish, Frankie walked him through a possible synthesis as easy as giving directions to the grocery store. The directions ended up working, so the researcher continued to consult with Frankie, along with most of the other researchers in the lab. They all figured that Frankie was their secret weapon, as everyone was doing amazing work, so they decided to keep it to themselves. The reason that productivity fell is because Frankie sleeps for half of the day, and the researchers ended up not bothering to do anything without consulting with Frankie first, because they would end up having to start projects over after Frankie corrected them, so why bother starting them on their own? The other reason productivity fell is because many of the researchers were busy with the breeding program, with the hopes that every lab in the foundation would someday have their own Frankie. On the one hand, it makes sense that the foundation would shut down and contain any sort of mind-altering anomaly, as there's no telling how far it might extend or what it might suddenly start to alter. On the other hand, it seems pretty beneficial, and the foundation would probably benefit from having a Frankie in every lab. Moving on to something far less comprehensible. SCP-1555 is a facility built into a mountain with an unknown origin and purpose. It appears to occupy nearly the entire interior of the mountain, and extends an unknown distance below sea level. Seismic surveys and ground-penetrating radar have mapped out some of this interior, but the internal layout has been known to shift in minor ways. The structure of the tunnels of the facility culminates near the peak of the mountain, at the very top of which is a steel tube, which extends out of the mountain. This tube extends 3 meters out at a 27 degree angle, and appears similar in construction to the barrel of a modern 155 mm howitzer. The tube has been observed to change shape, however with microscopic observation of the tube during transformation indicating that iron crystals appear on the surface of the tube, with no discernible source. These transformations typically manifest as an alteration to the muzzle, such as a muzzle booster or recoil brake, although other changes have been seen. The facility will, at unpredictable time periods, launch a projectile from this tube. The projectile usually travels at the standard muzzle velocity for a 155mm howitzer, but variations have been reported. In almost all cases, the shell lands intact in a valley 6 kilometers northeast of the mountain, and releases 5 to 16 Robertson's field mice. In most cases, the mice appear completely indistinguishable from natural Robertson's field mice, with a 50-50 gender division. Usually the mice show normal genetic deviation, but around 15% of the shells contain genetically identical mice. After the mice are released, the shell generally corrodes into dust within two hours. We're given a list of some of the deviations from this common practice, however, such as a shell that released 2,000 mice or one that did not follow a parabolic trajectory, instead flying out of Earth's atmosphere and past the orbit of Mars. Once the tube fired ten mice without a shell, with them landing scattered across the valley. One shell contained only ten mouse skeletons, while another was pushed out of the tube only by compressed air, landing directly in front of it and releasing one mouse. One shell contained a tangled mess of PNP bipolar transistors, and another time the tube fired 48 shells in extremely rapid succession, all containing three mice. One shell contained chlorine gas instead of mice, and another shell released five smaller shells mid-flight, each containing one mouse. Another shell continued traveling into the ground after landing, traveling an unknown depth into the earth. 
Another shell released mice continually for three hours, while another exploded in midair, releasing metal fragments similar to an ordinary high explosive artillery round. A Foundation agent was sent in to investigate, eventually going missing while in the tunnels, so an MTF was then sent in to find him. The first thing they comment on is the sheer number of pipes present throughout the facility. They then mention how clean the facility is, with all of the pipes being shiny and no dust present. They enter into a larger chamber filled with more pipes, along with some valves, some of which are labeled. One is labeled as makeup gas, while another says emulsion. After drilling into some of the pipes for samples, they find out that some of them are vacuum pipes, others contain steam, the makeup gas seems to be lead vapor, and the emulsion pipe contains an unknown thick yellow substance. The air in the facility is revealed to be exactly 75% nitrogen and 25% oxygen. They proceed deeper into the facility, eventually coming across a section of low radiation, which their suits protect them from. Soon after, they find a larger chamber with a machine in the center, with many pipes leading into it. This was revealed to be a standard United States naval reactor. One of the team begins to drill into a pipe leading into the reactor to take a sample, with the spectrometer revealing it to contain uranium hexafluoride. Before they can seal it off, however, the pipe suddenly increases in pressure and the gas bursts out over the agent. They proceed to run away from the reactor, swearing about the pipes, with the agent saying that he'll get cancer from this, but he'll live through today. They all agree to not touch any more of the pipes, and they continue on. Soon they find another chamber, this one opening up onto a large shaft that extends diagonally up and down, with a big bundle of pipes suspended from the ceiling going down the middle. There are a number of warning signs nearby, with one in German, and they learn that the atmosphere in the chamber is pure helium with no physical divider between the hallway and the chamber. Once they moved into the chamber, however, all of their electronics died, aside from their internal microphones, forcing the base to communicate with them through Morse code. After sitting there for a moment, though, all of their electronics spontaneously start on fire. Despite this, base tells them to proceed, but turn back if there's obvious danger. There's a stairway cut into the side of the shaft that they decide to take, and they hear wind blowing down the shaft. After traveling down for some time, they come across a doorway where they find the upper half of the missing agent, smoothly cut at the waist. They soon find what cut him in half, however, as a section of the hallway in front of them is filled with thin wires which slice the front of one of their rifle barrels as they walk forward. They find the lower half of the agent on the ground, in small enough pieces that it looks like sand. They decide to turn back and proceed up the stairway instead, with the wind now blowing up instead of down, and growing in intensity. When they go to grab onto the stairs railing, it melts in their hands. Eventually, the wind grows strong enough and begins to blow horizontally, knocking one of the team off the stairs where she's forced to grab onto some electrical lines that are running along the side. Unfortunately, the wires are hot enough to start burning through her suit, and before long, they reach her skin and fry her. The wind begins blowing down again, so they make it back to the hallway they entered the chamber from, but the hallway is now proceeding in the opposite direction as before, although their tether cable is still attached. The walls in the hallway have also changed, from concrete to riveted steel, painted matte olive. After moving through the hallway, they enter into another chamber, 
this one containing a large lake with a number of pipes leading into it. The lake appears to be a mile across, with halogen lights along the ceiling the entire way. There are blue lights underwater, and it looks like the lake is filled with nuclear reactors. They take a sample of the water and send the results back, which triggers a number of radiation alarms upon arrival, prompting base to order them to leave immediately. The team scrambles and follows the tether out of the chamber, coming to a rest a few minutes later. After one agent leans against a pipe on the wall, however, it falls off, releasing thousands of mice into the hallway. Another agent begins swearing again about the pipes and starts firing at them, with one pipe releasing a white, billowing cloud. They're forced to move through the cloud, which is extremely cold, and begins to ice up one of the agent's suits. Before long, he can't bend his elbows, and his oxygen tank becomes exposed. His lungs start freezing up, and eventually he can no longer bend his knees. He falls to the ground, causing his visor to smash open, and he's instantly killed. The others soon make it out of the cold, finding the other end of the pipe that the agent knocked loose. It looks empty, but there's a whooshing noise coming out of it, and soon a bunch of mouse hair starts spewing out of it. The two remaining agents continue following their tether for half an hour, coming into another chamber five or six stories tall. The walls of this chamber appear to be covered in what looks like asbestos halfway up, and there's a single pipe sticking out of the ceiling. It drops an object which shatters when it hits the floor, and upon closer inspection is revealed to have been a mason jar filled with a yellow powder. They send a sample back, and are informed that it's half sulfur and half tree pollen. Continuing along the tether, they find a wall covered almost floor to ceiling with open pipes, and after moving closer, they realize that the pipes are all rifled, like gun barrels. They attempt to scramble out of the way as an enormous amount of automatic gunfire erupts into the hallway for five minutes. Afterwards, one of the agents informs Base that he's the only one left alive now, and there's five inches of lead stuck to the wall. By now, Base had withdrawn 12 kilometers of tether despite sending in only 1,400 meters. Regardless, Base tells the agent that he's close to getting out, in order to keep up his morale. Unfortunately, the agent follows the tether to the end of the hallway, where the cable leads into a small pipe, three inches in diameter, sitting in the middle of the floor. At this point, the agent realizes that he's never leaving this place, so he tells Base that he's going to end things using his sidearm, and that there's a box under his bed with a note inside he wants delivered to his brother. He tells them to not send any more people into this place, not even D-Class, as nobody deserves this. Base tells him that he performed admirably, and they're sorry. The agent proceeds to cut the tether, and the log ends. Afterwards, over 60 kilometers of tether were pulled out, and no further exploration was performed by non-expendable personnel. Of course, there are plenty of expendable personnel. Extremely weird, with no explanation whatsoever for who built this facility and why although the surrounding area is said to be home to one of the few remaining populations of the fictional Robertson's field mice. Since that's the type of mice most commonly fired out from the facility, perhaps some anomalous organization was just really, really interested in keeping that species alive. So far, all of these rodent SCPs have either been singular entities or contained to a somewhat isolated area. Let's end by looking at an SCP that takes things to a bit larger of a scale. 
SCP-6668 refers to a large sinkhole that suddenly appeared in the floor of a Foundation site's cafeteria. It appeared at 8.47 local time, and since this document was created at 8.58, the situation is ongoing. The depth of the sinkhole has yet to be determined, but it is architecturally anomalous, primarily due to the fact that the cafeteria is located on the third floor, and there's nothing out of the ordinary visible on the second floor. When the sinkhole appeared, due to the cafeteria floor rapidly crumbling, junior researcher Morell fell into it, and contact has yet to be made with him. More curiously, once the sinkhole appeared, all food product within the cafeteria, including substances in people's mouths and stomachs, rapidly putrefied. Security footage shows the cafeteria filled with people during the breakfast service, and a small circular mark spontaneously appears on the floor in the center of the cafeteria. As junior researcher Morell gets up to return his tray, he steps upon the black mark. Instantaneously, the floor gives way and collapses inward, rapidly expanding until it is 5 meters in diameter. Despite the nature of the collapse, the hole formed into an oval shape with well-defined edges. Morell is the only individual to fall into it, as others quickly moved away. Simultaneous to this, all food in the vicinity rapidly decayed, with the food in the serving unit sprouting large amounts of fast-growing mold. Several diners spit food from their mouths, while the majority began to vomit. Cameras located in the training auditorium directly below the cafeteria show nothing unusual, with the auditorium ceiling showing no signs of damage or degradation. Refreshing the document page gives us a new version of it, from 9.44 am. The sinkhole is now classified as SCP-6668-1, while 6668-2 is an adult human, formerly a D-class, that began to display anomalous properties upon returning from an exploration of the sinkhole. We're given a log of the exploration. The D-Class was strapped into a harness, attached to a crane that was brought in to lower him into the hole. He says that it's real dark in there, and he can't see the sides anymore, suggesting that it's pretty big. After a couple minutes of descending, he begins complaining about the stench, which he states is worse than the moldy food up in the cafeteria. He descends for another 3 minutes, for a total of 37 meters, which would normally put him on level B5 of the facility. Suddenly, he's interrupted by a wet, squelching sound, and orders them to stop the crane. The D-Class was dropped up to his waist into a black, viscous liquid at the bottom of the pit, which only became visible due to the disruption of his body. The D-Class says that this black tar is where the rancid smell is coming from, but he can feel the floor underneath it, which he describes as soft. The area is still very dark, anomalously so, but he makes out a shape nearby that looks human. It's floating in the liquid, wrapped in a foundation lab coat. The body is face down, but he thinks that it's Morell, so the site director orders him to grab the body and they'll pull them out. The D-Class begins to breathe heavily as he approaches the body. But when he grabs the lab coat, the mass contained inside of it splinters into smaller parts and begins to rapidly move. A splashing sound is heard as the smaller masses move into the liquid, and the D-Class screams that it's not Morell, and they need to get him out of there. The crane begins to start pulling him out, but his camera starts jerking wildly as he exclaims that something's in his suit. He plunges his hands into the liquid and begins hitting at his legs, but the crane throws him off balance 
and he falls face first into the liquid. The crane pulls him out of the pit, but he remains silent on the way up, and the camera is obfuscated by the liquid. Upon recovery, he's found to be unconscious, but before the medical staff could arrive, his body began to levitate. He's now currently suspended in the air above the pit in a non-responsive state, and sounds of movement are audible from the sinkhole. Refreshing the page again gives us an update from 10.27 am, with a video log showing the developing situation. A team of researchers stand around the D-Class when his eyes suddenly snap back and glance rapidly around, making eye contact with one of the researchers. He begins to try to speak, so the site director stands on a chair and leans near his mouth. As his lips slowly open, a small paw pushes through them, followed by the rest of a large, wet rat. The rat crawls out of the D-Class's mouth and falls to the ground, quickly scurrying away. Immediately afterwards, a wet slurping noise comes from the D-Class, and a second, larger rodent starts to crawl out of his mouth. Unnoticed by the researchers, small red dots begin to appear on his uniform. His right cheek begins to bulge outwards, and apparently a third rodent has crawled up his esophagus, fighting with the second rat to get out. The D-Class's left eye then collapses in on itself into a white, damp pulp, and from within the socket another rodent begins to emerge. The D-Class's right eye is rapidly darting between the researchers. The red dots on his uniform continue to grow as one of the rodents in his mouth manages to claw through his cheek, pulling itself through and falling to the floor. Another rodent can now be seen crawling up his throat. Without warning, a large laceration forms on his right wrist, spraying the site director with blood and causing him to fall off the chair. A rodent begins to crawl its way out of the laceration followed by another. More and more rats pour out of his throat, now numbering around 50. The bones around his left eye have started to crumble, allowing space for more rodents to emerge. The flow of rodents from his wrist has intensified to the point of severing his right hand completely off, and other rodents are now crawling out of both of his ears. The number of rodents in the vicinity is in the hundreds now with a number of them swarming over the fallen site director, who's unable to stand. As another researcher tries to help him, the rodents charge at him as well, crawling up his legs. He flees from the area after apologizing to the site director, followed by the other researchers. The D-Class's skull has lost most of its structural integrity, and rodents are continuing to emerge from it. His uniform then ruptures open, releasing a flood of rats into the room that chase after the fleeing researchers. The rats tear into the site director's skin and attempt to climb into his mouth, which he can only prevent for so long. Eventually one gets in and begins crawling down his throat. The rest of the rodents then begin flooding out of the cafeteria, quickly overwhelming the three site security personnel that were sent in to help. The site director's body begins to convulse as it also levitates into the air and starts to discharge rodents in a similar manner to the D-Class. So far, estimates figure that between 1200 and 1700 rodents have emerged from the two, and sounds of movement and squeaking are audible from within the sinkhole. Another update brings us to 1156 which tells us that all personnel in the site are to evacuate, with floors B4 through 6 of the site to be considered lost. SCP-6668 is now the designation for anomalous rodents that originate from the sinkhole. They are to be considered hostile, lethal entities that will attempt to enter the body cavities of any human they encounter through any external body orifice. If they are unable to do so, 
They will create an artificial orifice through the use of their teeth and claws. These rats replicate through these human hosts, but anecdotes relating to a mimetic effect compelling individuals to willingly offer themselves to the rats are currently unsubstantiated. The site where this all occurred is currently undergoing a code black security breach, with the site being evacuated and MTF Lambda 12, pest control, ordered to come in and contain the anomaly. When trying to access the log of the MTF incursion however, we're informed that the incursion was cancelled. A notice informs us that by 05 authority, the evacuation order has been overridden and all staff are to shelter in place. The site has been placed under quarantine and the MTF has been withdrawn. Another update to the document from 1209 PM shows some hastily written text, apparently written by one of the researchers inside of the site. She's typing out a message from her phone and pleads for someone to unlock the emergency door as no one here is infected and the O5s can't just abandon them to die. She's interrupted however as the document refreshes and wipes out the text, now with a notice that informs us to disregard any restricted information we had been exposed to. The site has now been placed completely under quarantine with no excursion allowed, and the O5 Council are currently deliberating on containment procedures for SCP-6668. Both the rats and their human hosts are to be considered hostile, lethal entities, and security footage shows the rats climbing on top of each other in order to climb out of the sinkhole into the cafeteria. A vote from the O5 Council concerns a possible containment proposal for the site. First, the site's Morpheus security measure would be activated, emitting an inhalable sedative gas throughout the site. Then, the site's Hephaestus security measure would be activated, incinerating the entirety of the site's interior, with the exception of designated containment cells. Finally, eight hours later, MTF Lambda-12 would be sent in to confirm neutralization. All 13 council members agreed to the proposal, and were given another update from eight and a half hours later. No signs of life have so far been detected throughout the site after the activation of the two security measures. Curiously, the sinkhole is also no longer present, with the floor in the cafeteria appearing as it did prior to the morning's events. It's certainly rare for the Foundation to actually solve a problem with liberal usage of fire, but it seems like it did the trick here. Unfortunately, a rodent of unknown origin with burn wounds and scorched fur was recently sighted in a nearby city. Quarantine measures have been placed on standby, and excursion into the city is forbidden. Ah well. Hopefully that's enough rodents to last you a while, ranging from lovable rats that help you find your lost keys, to rats that will help you lose your internal organs. Rats and mice in general are a pretty easy source of horror, as they naturally bother many people and are often harbingers of pestilence and problems. There certainly aren't as many rodent SCPs as there are for dogs and cats, but there are at least a few particularly odd ones.